Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Did anyone come here farther away than Centralia today? <laughs> Centralia, where are you? Raise your hand. Look at that. And he walked all the way. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome to our first 2024 Saturday Speaker Series. I'm John Offterborough, president of our society. And, and uh, isn't it great that we're not meeting like we were a year ago, still, you know, in the throes of after pandemic, and many of you are watching us from Zoom. So we're glad that you got in the driveway and drove down here, fought the parking out there because there's a slug of little kids playing basketball next door. But thank you for being here. And thanks to Joanne Potter arranging for all of the volunteers who set everything up and so forth, which is really cool. And also, uh, Mary uh, Sullivan is out there providing the treats. She and Cynthia are from Compass Realty Brokerage and are nice enough to bring treats to us uh, on Saturday mornings. And the reason they're here is they could possibly, if any of you are thinking of selling your home or your property sometime in the next 20 years or 10 years, <laughs> they would be happy to uh, list it. And not only that, they help you downsize. They'll pack your stuff for you and even move it. And after all of that, they share some of their brokerage fees with us, so we appreciate that. So we got off to a roaring start two weeks ago at the historic Happy Valley Grange, where our friends over here are longtime, uh, uh, what would you say? You, you don't own it, it's just sort of like you own it, right, Dwayne? You live it, though. Longtime President Dwayne Isaacson. Anyway, uh, we had a great time out there. We had about 70 people at our ice cream social. People were taking down ice cream covered with all kinds of goodies, and uh, we had a real nice, nice event there. Uh, did some fundraising. We're in the process of trying to raise some money to digitize the last few years of the Sammamish, Sammamish Valley News. Um, as a reminder, for any of you who haven't renewed your membership, you can step into our office museum uh, on the way out and, and take care of that. So just to show you how cutting edge our organization is with our Saturday Speaker Series, uh, a year ago in November, David Berger came and talked about razor clams in Washington. So how many of you are razor clam fans? Well, a few. They're hard to dig. So the, month, the, the next meeting in January, just a year, or February, just a year ago, David Williams came and, and talked about his book, Home Waters. And he went on and on about the most famous bivalve in Puget Sound, the gooey duck. So our legislature is really busy with a lot of important stuff. But if you read the Seattle Times, the Battle of the Bivalves, Thursday, you can still get it online. And the legislature is trying to come up with, you know, the clam, the Washington State clam, whether it'll be the razor clam or the gooey duck. So write your legislator. Tell them what you think. You know, we already have the Olympia oyster, which is terrific. So, I digress, I guess. And you want to watch our next newsletter? Many of you get this in print or online. And I'm doing an article on eateries in Washington State, going back to the first eateries here, which were 12,500 years ago. And, uh, well, Bobby, you weren't there. But if you were there, you would have a menu that had 280 menu items that I got from the Burke Museum, from the sea, from the river, from the land, from the air. And you know, some of those people lived well over the hundreds because they weren't eating flour and sugar and those evil carbs. Anyway, uh, that's, that's what the indigenous people were eating at that point. So now I'd like to uh, read you our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are in the ancestral lands of the coast. Salish peoples who continue to steward these lands and waters as they have since time immemorial. 
We recognize Washington's tribal and indigenous or native organizations which actively create, shape, and contribute to our thriving communities. The Redmond Historical Society is committed to doing our part to engage with and amplify the voices of native peoples and tribes. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn the mic over to our executive vice president, my pal, the uh, editor of our newsletter, program director, Laura Lee Benton. Thank you, John. Welcome, everybody. Um, before I get started, I'd like to call up Holly to do a quick little switcheroo here on the slides. It's great to see so many people here. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you. A couple reminders before I introduce our speaker. Please make sure you've turned off your cell phones. And please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. We'll be uh, having a Q&A after Felix uh, tells us all about the hidden aviation history of Bankerson Park. Or what? Shout out answers and things randomly. Oh, well, just forget what I just said. Okay. <laughs> okay, forget that. Well, I guess we're going to do a call and response. So, um, and Felix just requested that I keep his intro short and sweet, so here we go. Felix Benel is a broadcaster and historian who focuses on Pacific Northwest history, geography, cartography, and pop culture. We have had the pleasure of hosting Felix in the past. In 2018, as a Humanities Washington speaker, he brought us stories of the origins of Pacific Northwest radio. We hosted Felix again in 2020, one of our first online programs when we were still learning how to Zoom, when he brought us amazing stories, film, and audio clips depicting historic weather in Washington State. And again in 2023, Felix joined us to share stories behind some of the surprising formal and informal names of places and things around the Evergreen State. Today, for the fourth time, Felix brings us another fascinating topic, the hidden aviation history of Magnuson Park and the story behind the first world flight, which is celebrating its centennial this year. Give a big hand to Felix Benel. Thanks, Laura Lee. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, John. Let me just get my water bottle out here. Excuse me. Uh, okay. All right, boy, if I knew this many people were going to show up, I would have spent far more time uh, preparing for today's presentation, so I'm just going to apologize in advance. All right. It is great to be. You guys do a wonderful job with these programs. I've given talks like this around the state and different historical societies and things, and most places do a good job. You guys do a fantastic job, and it's so nice. Yeah. Um, sort of post-pandemic or whatever whatever this era will eventually be called, it's nice to be in person again. I know we were in person a year ago, but it still felt a little like lots of masks. And it's okay to wear masks too. I, I was wearing a mask earlier this week. I'm getting over my first post-COVID cold, you know, non-COVID, but still stuffy head and everything. That's, I haven't had a cold for about four years. All right, so today we're talking about uh, the hidden aviation history at Magnuson Park. Um, what I've assembled is a collection of still photos. I found some old film clips. Um, some other information, not a, not a comprehensive, you know, uh, A to Z history of Sandpoint and Magnuson Park, but some of the highlights that relate to the aviation history there. Um, let's see. Uh, going to not going to jump around too much chronologically, um, but we're going to start with a film clip from the 1950s. So I grew up in Kirkland. Um, my earliest memory is probably the early 1970s. By then, the Navy base at Sandpoint was pretty much shut down in terms of the aviation aspect of it. But I remember being at Marina Park in Kirkland as a really little kid and looking across, and you could still see all the hangars, lots of different colors. The trees weren't all filled in the way they are now. If you look at Sandpoint from Kirkland now, it's it looks like a park because it is. But in those days, it was clear there was interesting stuff going on. You could see the runways, you could see the big hangars and everything. And so this, while well, this film clip predates that by about 15 years, 
this to me is sort of this golden era, this last gasp of the, uh, the cool aviation history at Sandpoint. Um, this is about a two minute clip, it's silent. It's shot on 16 millimeter. I think one of these uh, weekend warriors, a Naval Reserve pilot, went out on a trading flight or uh, just a regular flight one day with, a, a, with another, two planes took off together. So we'll see color footage of a plane taking off, a PB-4Y which is a variation on the Liberator, the bomber from World War II. Um, and they take off, they fly around. Let's, let's just go right to the film clip and watch. And it's silent, so I can talk over it. Everyone, can everyone see it okay? <laughs> I think three of, three of the five sailors have movie cameras. I think they have eight millimeter cameras, which are consumer model. I think this film's actually shot with 16. And the color is just beautiful. We'll see the, um, we'll see the plane taking off. To the north, it's a sunny day, so the winds are coming from the north, so we take off to the north right over the top of Lake Washington. We'll see the country club off on the left-hand side there. Pontiac Bay. And, you know, I found this entire clip on YouTube, and they fly all over the place. It goes on and on, but I, I picked some highlights here. We see the old I-90 or US-10 floating bridge with the bulge. Everyone, who remembers the bulge on the old floating bridge? Yeah. The draw span, where they had to actually have a space for the draw span to go. The, the original Narrows Bridge. Well, not the original Narrows Bridge. This is the 1950 Narrows Bridge, the second Narrows Bridge. Deception Pass, of course. They got all over Puget Sound on this flight. It's unclear how long they would have been out on a flight like this. But in a moment here, we'll see the other plane they're flying alongside of. And they get really close to Mount Rainier. PB4Y. You can see the shape of the, I think it's a little bit longer than a typical uh, B-24 Liberator, but same basic airframe. And then uh, you see Mount Rainier here for a second, and then before you know it, they come up on a, uh, approaching from the south to the runway at Sandpoint. You'll see all the tire marks as they approach the uh, actual uh, runway. Kind of the ball turret up in the front, or turret up in the front and the nose of the plane. It seems like he's moving around just to show the fact he can move around. <laughs> I love this shot here. This is just such a cool piece of film clip. I've never seen anything like it before. Really gives you a sense of this, in, you know, this active, you know, honest to goodness Navy base right there on the shores of Lake Washington. Um, now the history of Sandpoint, just ever so quickly. Magnuson Park, it's a city park now. It's about 350 acres. It was dedicated back in 1977, named after Warren G. Magnuson, our, one of our two uh, big Democratic senators in the second half of the 20th century. And Magnuson served in the Navy, so he was an, uh, he was an appropriate person to name it after. Um, it's, uh, before it was Sandpoint, there was Carkeek Park was there back uh, e even in the early part of the 20th century before the, uh, before the locks had changed the lake level. Um, and that uh, Carkeek Park name got transferred to the Carkeek Park we know of in North Seattle. But they, uh, for a long time they had at that park before the Navy base went in there, before the airfield went in there, an old fire bell that was installed in the city after the Great Seattle Fire in 1889. Does anyone ever remember seeing that fire bell at Mohai back in the 50s or 60s? Yeah, that's now, it's in front of the, the uh, newest Mohai down there on South Lake Union. So it's just south of Matthews Beach Park there, um, just north of the National Archives branch there along Sandpoint Way. And my crackpot theory or my thesis about this whole presentation is that Sandpoint really, more than any other place, it's, it's not the only place where aviation developed in the Pacific Northwest, but so many things happened there with direct local connections, but that had national impact as well. I think it, it's, it warrants being either a national historic area, some unit of the national park system, something that, that really recognizes it for the key role it played in the development of aviation, military aviation, as well as civil aviation, right here in the Pacific Northwest. So we'll see if I can prove that. That's, I'm out to prove that today as we talk about this stuff. Um, and so what we'll cover is how it became an airfield, some of the earliest aviation structures that were there, some of the things that might still be there if you know where to look. We will talk about the around the world flight of 1924. And one of the things that was the biggest surprise to me when I first learned this oh, less than a decade ago is that Sandpoint functioned as the Boeing company is essentially the first delivery center where they would actually deliver their finished aircraft to the customer, whether it was a military or uh, for commercial use. We'll look at some famous visitors who came.
We'll look at the Boeing Clippers, which weren't technically at Sand Point, but they were just north of there at Matthews Beach. And we'll talk about a couple of missing aviators who took off from Sand Point back in 1949 and a search that was in, ensued for them and the ultimate uh, memorial that was created for those guys. Um, you know, the, the teens in the 1920s, it's such an exciting era of development in terms of transportation, communication. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the improvements that were made or the kinds of things that were developed, whether it was the urban center of Seattle or the highway system or, you know, uh, civil aviation, radio, uh, certainly. It all kind of comes together in 1920 where if you took somebody from 2023 and dropped us into 1925, 1926 or so, you'd know, you'd recognize it, you'd be able to function. You wouldn't be like, you know, trying to like light your tallow lamp. You'd know how to turn on the electricity and listen to the radio and drive your car. The, the world we take for granted now, it really comes together in 1920, in the 20s. And aviation is a huge part of that. So specifically as it relates to Sand Point and, and Northwest history and aviation history, the Lake Washington Ship Canal opens in 1917. You know, the locks, the Montlake Cut, the canal between Fremont and um, <clears throat> Ballard. The level of Lake Washington drops about nine feet. It creates new real estate around the lake. Um, it stops the Black River from flowing down at the south end of uh, Lake Washington. It takes a place like Sand Point and makes it slightly larger and less boggy. You know, the, the, the water goes away, so you have more usable real estate. Around the same time, World War I is underway, right? The U.S. gets involved in 1917. It all ends in 1918. But that very mechanical, mechanized warfare, the, the, what they're using with uh, airplanes in Europe, it brings home to local leaders the fact that we're vulnerable. I mean, if there is some, if the war to end all wars truly wasn't the war to end all wars and we're going to be in conflict again, we're probably vulnerable to some kind of aerial attack. Same way we felt we were vulnerable to a naval attack, you know, in the 19th century. So there was this notion of how do we defend the West Coast? What do we do? What can we do in terms of aviation um, to defend the West Coast for the next conflict? At the same time, the aviation industry is, is growing. You know, Boeing's been founded in 1916 and is building um, float planes and trying to get involved in uh, serving the airmail industry. And the federal government is looking around at locations to site uh, additional facilities for military aircraft. We've got the shipyard um, over in Bremerton. And the idea is to find some place near there where you can put some kind of a naval uh, aviation facility. And Sandpoint makes it onto a list and gets, the list gets narrowed down pretty quickly while the government is looking around. And uh, at one point, a bunch of military flyers visit Seattle. Um, these are flying planes with wheels on them, and there's no place for them to land. There's no dedicated airfield, so they have to land at the golf course. And that's viewed as a bit of a civic embarrassment. It's like we have no place for the military to land their planes other than a golf course. All these things kind of combine, and you have the King County Commissioners. That's before we had a single King County Executive, we used to have a three-member King County Commission. And they get a lot of the credit for identifying Sandpoint, identifying the Navy's interest in it, and working to gather the property, purchase the property there to, to sort of bundle it and then donate it to the government or have the government officially take over and make the improvements to it. Um, and that, as early as 1920, King County wants the U.S. Navy to take over Sandpoint. It takes a couple of years. There's some uh, bureaucratic things that get in the way and legislative things that get in the way. Um, the Navy ultimately agrees to lease Sandpoint, doesn't take a delivery of it right away. But meanwhile, the, Na the Army also is in, in the early days of aviation. The Army has airplanes that they're flying and they're, um, they're building hangars and they're involved in World War I with their military aircraft. And they're all sort of waiting for it to all come together with Congress. It ultimately all gets official by about 1926 that the Navy officially takes over what had been the Sandpoint Airfield um, that the, the King County had created. So in the 1920s, in that, that, that first decade, I think the first airplane actually lands officially at Sandpoint in 1920. And it's perfectly situated because you have a big flat area that works as a grass airfield. This isn't a paved runway like we saw in that film a moment ago. This is a very early, like a cow pasture kind of thing. But it also has this great proximity to Pontiac Bay. That's the water just to the north. And they'll make all kinds of improvements over in the late 20s and the 30s that marry that combination of accessibility for float planes 
and accessibility for planes on wheels and the ability to interchange those. It's kind of a magical part of Sandpoint that makes it just not, not necessarily unique, but definitely distinctive in terms of a, of, of a perfect spot to put the kind of military facility that was envisioned around 1918 and that really comes to fruition throughout the 20s and 30s and into the 40s as well. Um, one of the, you know, the key to any old military base, I don't know what it is, when you ever go to like Fort Casey or Fort Warden, there's something really cool to know that the federal government was here and built all this major infrastructure that's still here, even though it's been technically abandoned by the troops or the sailors or whatever for decades, the material stays behind. I, I'm attracted to places like that. I don't think it's irrational, it's just sort of this, the history of infrastructure is, is the history of, of civilization in my mind. So infrastructure is key to understanding how Sandpoint comes together. And while the Navy is sort of trying to figure out if they're going to actually take possession of Sandpoint, if they're going to lease it, if they're going to actually you know, own it, the Army comes in and has a surplus metal hangar um, from uh, an Army base down in California. They agree to bring it, deliver it to Sandpoint, and King County will put, pay for the labor to, to assemble it. So in early 1923, this very sort of a standard design of a metal hangar gets installed and constructed right there, sort of the north edge of, uh, near the edge of the lake, and, the, and the, it would be just west of the, uh, the main uh, grass runway. Um, it's there from 1923 to 1931. A little foreshadowing here. I don't know if you can read that down here at the bottom. This is uh, from the uh, instructions given to the people who will be in the, re the receiving committee when um, Charles Lindbergh visits Seattle in 1927. And it says, upon landing, Colonel Lindbergh will taxi his plane to the large U.S. Army hangar where it will immediately be placed under guard of an adequate detail of U.S. Marines. So that's just a little bit of foreshadowing of the role this hangar will play and all sorts of interesting things that happen. And it's, just this really, it's only there for about eight years, from 1923 to 1931 until it's dismantled because by the late 20s, Sandpoint is, is maturing and growing and evolving and this, this very desirable 1923 hangar is, doesn't really fit into the picture anymore. Does anybody know where that hangar ended up? And Lee Corbin, who did all this research for me, he can't really answer the question. Anyone else know, want to take a guess where the hangar, when it, when it was dismantled, where it went? All right. So there's the hangar. The upper picture is that's the hangar in place at Sandpoint in the 1920s. And the lower picture is where the hangar is, remains to this day. When it was moved in 1931, the spot it was moved to was old Fort, um, Fort Townsend. Not, Fort, not Port Townsend, but Fort Townsend, which is just south of Port Townsend. Now it's at Jefferson County Airport. The hangar is still standing, still completely operable, and housing a place called Tailspin Tommies, which is an aircraft, um, like a repair facility. So, you know, built U.S. Army tough. You know, you, built, you build a hangar in the teens, and more than 100 years later, it's still standing. You know, it's a pretty amazing tale of that. Uh, I think that, that sort of speaks to why that infrastructure is so appealing in history, when stuff can be, this lasts for so long. All right, so... Um, the around the world flight. The hangar plays a role in this too, of course. Um, it is the centennial this year. This is one of these things, you know, I don't know why this flight isn't better known. Um, I have a feeling the centennial this year will help move the needle a little bit, but Charles Lindbergh gets so much attention for his, you know, his transatlantic flight in 1927. Amelia Earhart, I mean, she did all sorts of feats before she disappeared. It's almost like Lindbergh and Earhart are the two most famous flights in American history. This one, I think, is either is a, should be a close second to Lindbergh rather than the, whatever Amelia Earhart accomplished as a female aviator. Um, the f there were four planes, Douglas World Cruisers, that departed from Sandpoint on April 6, 1924. Um, they returned on September 28th. Four planes left. Only two of the original planes made it all the way around and one replacement plane. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the, uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on for the centennial this year. On, the, on April 6th, there's going to be a lecture at the Museum of Flight by the Boeing historian Mike Lombardi. He's really great. He knows all sorts of cool details about the, the uh, around the world flight. If you're really into aviation stuff, I would uh, put that on your calendar for April 6th. And then out at Sandpoint in September, there's going to be a big celebration. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to do in terms of bringing aircraft in since there's no runways there anymore, but there will be all sorts of stuff in the works for that. Um, but you go back 100 years ago, and this is kind of what Sandpoint looked like. I'm not sure the exact date of this photograph, but if you look in the lower left, there's the hangar, our friendly peripatetic hangar. 
There's a pier that they built in order to uh, uh, service the, you know, let vessels come and go and also to do some work on the, uh, the around the world flight airplanes. And then you'll see the grass runway there. Look how, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how flat that runway is, but it doesn't look like super smooth, flat like an ironing board. It's got some, it's got some, uh, some bumps to it. And we'll see some footage in a moment that might have contributed to uh, an incident out there at some point. But I have a little bit of, uh, let's see, is this footage? Yeah, this is a little bit of a film clip. This uh, around the world flight was so well documented um, by the aviators themselves. The, the, I didn't know this footage existed until I first saw it about 10 years ago. And there's a particular scene in this, in this, um, this clip we're going to watch where one of the airplanes is coming around to approach to land at Sandpoint. And you look down, you see the trees. You see how rural Sandpoint looked in 1924 compared to the way it looked in 1955 that we saw a moment ago. So let's watch this clip here. And again, it's a silent clip. That's a Douglas World Cruiser. They built four of them down in Santa Monica. It's got a 12-cylinder, an L12 Victory engine. It's um, water-cooled, has a big radiator on the front. So it looks, it's, it's not like the uh, rotary engine you see on airplanes not too much longer after this. It's on wheels, um, so it takes off from Santa Monica from the factory and flies up north to Seattle. This film kind of gets a chronology not quite straight. They talk about crossing the Columbia and then passing Mount Shasta. So I think they're either, they're a little confused. They either met Rainier or they put the footage of Shasta in the wrong spot. I can't tell from the footage. Maybe you tell me what you think when you see this big mountain. Is that Mount Rainier or is that Mount Shasta? I'll, I'll be curious to see what you say. That, that looks like the Columbia to me, but I'm not positive. And these are army flyers. There's two people on each plane. It's a two-person crew. So he's safely over Mount Shasta. <laughs> Is that Shasta? Does anyone know their Mount Shasta images? I'm not sure. Arriving at Sandpoint, Seattle. This is a shot. I love this shot right here. Look at that. You look down at the ground, and you see through the struts and the wires. There's already one plane on the ground. Here they come in for a landing. Just a great clip. Um, so here's the four Douglas World Cruisers on the ground at Sandpoint. And so they're on wheels, right? And their flight they're going to make around the world, they're going to go westbound up to Alaska, cross over to Asia, cross India, Europe. Between here and Japan, what is there a lot of if you speak in geographical terms or uh, water, right? So Sandpoint is the perfect place to convert these planes with wheels to planes with floats. Um, here's a great shot of one of those uh, L-12 engines, the Liberty 12 engine. A federal government project, um, they, they sought designers and vendors and kind of built about 20,000 of these engines at the end of, uh, end of World War I to kind of create all this uh, material for the aviation industry. And it's modular. There's, um, I think there, it can be, yeah, they're in like four-cylinder modules, so they can be an inline four or an inline or a V8 or a V12. It's a brilliant you know, aluminum cast engine that can be set up in different, different configurations. A brilliant strategy to design one basic cylinder setup and then be able to use it in multiple different, uh, different uh, configurations. So floats, right? Planes with floats are going to have a much better time, much easier time if there's trouble between Seattle and Prince Rupert, B.C., or between Prince Rupert, B.C. and Sitka, Alaska, or Seward, Alaska, or out through the Aleutians out to Japan. And so they flow, they flew up to Seattle to have this work done. The floats, the pontoons were designed by George Pocock, the famous designer of those racing shells that the boys in the boat won the gold medal with in 1936. Um, with help from Boeing. William Boeing is very much involved in Sandpoint. He's key to, the, to Sandpoint being chosen as a Navy base. He's key to all the aviation stuff that happens there. That's why Boeing chose it as their delivery center. It really is, it's the cradle of where Boeing is doing all their business, other than manufacturing in, in this time period. So here we see one of the pontoons being hustled out to the end of the dock that we saw in that aerial shot. Here is um, an image of the boats, or the, the airplanes, the Douglas World Cruisers in transition. I'm not sure if that barge with that crane was designed specifically for, for this work. It might have been just something that was some other marine construction company had. But you'll see, I've tracked down this piece of footage. I only recently found this. Here, let me go back a second. 
I've seen this picture for years. It's like one of these still images. It's, it's, if you've done any kind of aviation research in, in the Seattle area, you sort of know this image. So when I found this little film clip next, it's like, it's like in Harry Potter where they have the pictures on the wall and the people are alive in the picture frames. That's what this looks like to me when you see this film footage of the tail end of the conversion of the, the Douglas World Cruisers with wheels having their pontoons put on and then being dropped into the lake by the crane. And this, of course, is silent. This is at the University of South Carolina. There was a Fox movie tone photographer working in the Seattle area in the 1920s. Um, so for, you know, it's, it's kind of frustrating because this archive in South Carolina has all this great footage, a lot of it, you know, shot in the Northwest, all about the Northwest, but it lives, you know, 3,000 miles from here. But to see that crane in motion like that, you sort of see, you know, to see the plane kind of teetering back and forth like that, and it's just, it literally brings the still images alive, and as, as cliche as that sounds, I just, and this is the actual Seattle that we're looking at. There was the, the planes were named after cities, the Seattle, the Chicago, the New Orleans, and the Boston. Spoiler alert, the Seattle was the first one to crash. <laughs> In Alaska, not far into the trip, just, just, not just, a, a, just a few weeks into the trip, the Seattle went down. The two pilots survived. And if you look in the background, I think that would be probably um, St. Edward State Park. You know, it's the, it's the north part of Lake Washington on the, over on the east, east side of the lake, 100 years ago. Anyway, it's just cool to see the crane comes off. And there's something about the way this footage was transferred. It's, you know, it's not all herky-jerky, the way a lot of silent film is transferred. And you see the guy standing on the pontoons, gives you the sense of the human scale. You might be able to see where it says Seattle on the cowling there, just uh, aft of the radiator, because it's a, it's a, you know, a water-cooled engine. And the last part of this footage, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's, either, it's the exhaust for the plane or something. They, you see a few seconds of this uh, gas uh, emission being jetted out of this exhaust pipe at the tail end of this plane. And I don't have an explanation for that other than that they were just testing the engine or something. So that comes up here in just a second. But yeah, there's more better view of the other side of Lake Washington there up on the Juanita and to the north. Yeah, I like this part here. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Just the exhaust from the engine? No. Hmm, nobody knows? All right. So again, another famous photograph. Come to, I mean, this is an image. It's, I've seen this at the Museum of History and Industry for years. I've seen this in old books. And we just saw that footage of it coming alive. OK, so the Seattle crashed uh, in, oh boy, I think it was in May of, uh, or late April of, of 24. Um, the two pilots survived. They went and visited the crash scene back in the 1960s. Um, Lowell Thomas's son, Lowell Thomas Jr., Lowell Thomas, the 19, early sort of 20s and 30s broadcaster, they went to the crash site and recovered the wheel from the, the, the crash Seattle plane. And that there's a Seattle 2 that's been built that's down in Centralia, or Chehalis. And uh, Lowell Thomas Jr. gave the steering wheel from the original Seattle 1 to the owner of the Seattle 2. And there are some plans at some point to fly that full-scale, fully operational replica of the Seattle 2. Um, but uh, by the time you get to September 28th of 1924, Three planes arrive. Um, the Boston is a replacement because the original Boston has crashed. The pilot survived. And the New Orleans and the Chicago and the Boston, too, all come back and arrive about 1.30 in the afternoon in, in Seattle. Something like 50,000 people are gathered at Sandpoint. It's considered to be the largest gathering in Seattle since Armistice Day in 1918, where more than that gathered in downtown Seattle. And probably the biggest gathering, public gathering, until VJ Day in August of 45. So it's a real, real standout event. I'll be really curious to see how much, um, how much attention and enthusiasm and focus the Friends of Magnuson Park can generate to get people to turn out for the event this this September. Because it's 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 if, who's driven past the little monument at the head of uh, entrance to Sandpoint to the World Flight. Yeah, there's the, there's a, it's a, whoops, it's a little spire with a, some bronze wings on it designed by Victor Alonzo Lewis, the same guy who designed the, uh, 
the Doughboy statue, which used to be at Seattle Center, which is now up at Evergreen with Shelley. Um, but the, where the monument is now, you can't really get to it. It's sort of very hostile, pedestrian, unfriendly. So that originally was out at the end of the, uh, along the runway and was dedicated at the end of the flight in, in 1924. So anyway, what's that? Will Thomas was Lieutenant Governor of the State of Alaska. Bill Thomas Jr. Yeah, like it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was. He uh, made, made a life made a life for himself up there. Um, all right. So the world flight, 1924. It's you know aviation is becoming something that's not just for war. People are thinking about um, sort of uh, use, uses of aviation in the public sector and just the com com consumer sector. And the biggest transformation that was happening in that area was around airmail. From about 1920 on, this notion of being able to send a document or anything, first class mail, and have it get across country in a matter of days rather than a matter of weeks or you know, a week by train or something, had revolutionized the whole notion of communicating. Um, obviously, there's no fax machines or anything like that. Um, and the government had invested a lot of money in creating a whole infrastructure around the airmail system. Beacons, like lighted beacons lit by gas and flames that would burn at night so aviators could find their way across these routes that went from you know, east to west in, in the north part, central part, and southern part of the United States. Emergency airfields where airmail pilots could land if they ran out of fuel, if there were problems. And depots where planes could land and refuel and switch off to the next vendor, taking the letter down the, you know, down the line to the next station. Airmail was huge, a huge boost to aviation, and to get a government airmail contract was a great way to get your privately, you know, private aviation company off the ground, literally. Um, and what Boeing did, they built mail planes, right? They built a kind of plane, they built about 27 of these. It's the Model 40. This was their first non-military plane. And they built 27 of these, delivered them at Sandpoint in that summer of 1927. And these were used by the Boeing Air Transport Company, which morphed into what became United Airlines, and which is, you know, just, this is the DNA, this is like the f early moments of United Airlines we're witnessing out there among the trees and the grass at Sandpoint, you know, 90, what's that, 90, uh, 97 years ago? If you know your Boeing history, you know that the government broke up Boeing and United Airlines and all the antitrust stuff in the 1930s. But for a while there, Boeing was operating this private air service that first carried airmail and later carried passengers. But it all begins out there at Sandpoint. They would put the airplane frames on a truck, and drive it out to Sandpoint, and attach the wings, and then, you know, away you go. Um, see, these are the planes being assembled. Here's the assembled planes. This is a military plane. They were also uh, delivering to the Army at that point. This is 1929. This is a few years later. This is the F-4. And then uh, this is a piece of footage of one of their planes, the Model 15. This was a, 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 there were several variations of this for different branches of the military. But Boeing built these and delivered them at Sandpoint. And this is a piece of footage from the Boeing archives. It is, it's a pretty rare piece of footage, but you'll see um, how the, uh, either the pilot came in too fast or something went wrong on this little, this little uh, visit to Sandpoint by a Boeing uh, Model 15. Again, it's silent. Everything looks, looks good so far, right? Look how, see how, look how unsmooth, how unlevel that surface is. That's the part that blows me away. It's like, oops. And you can see the wheel is really badly damaged. The wing is pretty badly damaged. The pilot's ego, also badly damaged. <laughs> he frustratingly takes off his little pilot's cap there. But it almost looks, I mean, it almost looks like the, I mean, I think they planted grass there to keep it, give it a surface so that it wouldn't get muddy. Oh, wait, hey, I'm gonna take it back a second. Can I go back a second on this? No, oh, maybe not. There was just a tiny glimpse of the little hangar there in the background. Propellers destroyed. See the wheel, the wheels damaged, the, you know, the gear. So it wasn't all fun and games with aviation. Aviation was dangerous, of course, and there's you know, numerous crashes that happened at Sandpoint. There's some famous ones, there's others that are just forgotten about. And the, you know, the, the waters around Sandpoint are littered with the carcasses of airplanes that either crashed there or that were dumped there after they were de deemed you know, un unrepairable. Now, in terms of famous visitors, um, we had that summertime of 27 when Boeing is out there delivering its airmail planes to get Boeing Air Transport Company off the ground. 
Now, May 19, who, who remembers May 1927? Probably nobody in the audience, right? <laughs> my, my father is deceased. He was, he'd be 101 if he were still alive. He was four years old in May of 1927, growing up in Poland, and he remembers being a little kid. He remembered being a little kid, hearing on the radio that Lindbergh had landed in France. He, that was a big deal, even in you know, Poland, where he lived with his family back in 1927. And so Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, was a hero for flying across the Atlantic solo in the, in the spirit of St. Louis. And he went on a tour, kind of a victory tour, around the United States in the summer and early autumn of 1927, and he visited Seattle. Um, the, they say that something like one in four Americans in 1927 saw Charles Lindbergh in person. And that's like, that's hard to imagine that happening. This is a terrific still photograph of the spirit of St. Louis flying over. I'm not clear if this is a departure or arrival. But he's flying over the, uh, the tower that existed there in 27. You see our friend, the little peripatetic hangar down there in the lower right. Some other military aircraft parked in front of the day hangar there. And there's a pass for the, um, the event they held for him, a big public event at the, uh, the football stadium at the University of Washington. And so um, this is a nice clip. This is a wonderful clip. This was, film was discovered just less than a decade ago um, by a member of the Hit family. This was a family that owned a big fireworks company in the Rainier Valley in Seattle. It was in business from the 1890s to about the 1940s. There's a park now it's just off of Rainier Avenue where the, the firework factory used to be. But uh, one of the granddaughters discovered this reel of film. It said, like, she found it in an outdoor shed in a can, like in a rusty, rusty film can, and it was all in good enough shape. University of Washington restored it and shared it online. So we're going to watch a couple clips. First, we'll watch this clip of Lindbergh arriving in Seattle in September 1927 at Sandpoint, of course. So I think he buzzes over the field twice, maybe to check landing conditions. Maybe that's just part of the show. He seemed to have a... Uh, a routine that he did at the different cities he visited. He had just been in Spokane earlier in the day and flown over, flown down um, through Yakima and over the pass. So he makes one pass by and then comes in for a landing um, from the north. Bounces onto the runway. And look at the mounted guards in the background. There's like a, a mounted someone on horseback every 30 or 40 feet lining the whole uh, western edge of the, or eastern edge of the runway, which I think is really cool. Wipe my nose, excuse me. I mean, this is just about four months after he made the history-making flight. And to actually have the aviator and the actual plane he did it in arriving in your town, you know, so many Americans experienced this. But to see the Seattle version of it, there's something, that's, that's Bertha Landis, the Seattle's first female mayor, standing there next to him there in the hat. And the guy in this newsboy cap keeps getting in the way of the shot here. It's like... <laughs> Lindbergh looks a little dazed. I mean, he's, at this point, he's done this probably oh, 15 or 20 times, maybe. This is, we're about halfway through the tour, I think, where Seattle is on the, on the tour map. <laughs> anyway, I just, and this is all happening inside that hangar, right? That's just like it said in that little piece of paper we foreshadowed. And so they get on a boat, um, a yacht belonging to a member of the Seattle Yacht Club, and they hustle everybody over to Husky Stadium. Or I, think it was, I think it was called Husky Stadium by then, yeah. And they do a big public event for him, and uh, he stays in Seattle that night. Um, and then... <laughs> I love those titles on that film. Those hand, handwritten titles are very cool. The next morning. We need more open touring cars. Why don't we have open touring cars anymore? I guess probably because of the Kennedy assassination. Sorry. <laughs> but look, how, look at this, you know, the wingspan of the plane. You see how it just fits, almost kind of barely fits into the hangar. I would guess they didn't need this many people pushing the plane, but I think the opportunity to be one of the uh, plane pushers was probably too hard to resist for someone just standing there. This is a famous still photo I've seen many times. Here's the emotion picture version of it. So he takes off pretty quickly here. He flies back over a few times. The film gets a little dark for a second, and I can't tell if he actually did a, a touch and go again, but he does some almost what you would call aerobatics before he heads off uh, south of Seattle. 
Oh, one thing, he's taking off to the south because whenever the weather's bad, the wind's coming from the south with a, you know, a, a cyclone. And when the weather's nice, you take off to the north because of the prevailing winds in this Seattle area. It's almost acrobatic move here, which is pretty cool. I mean, doesn't he know that's an artifact that he's flying? It's going to be in the Smithsonian someday? See, this is the part that I'm not clear what this, because this is in the, in, next in the footage. It almost looks like he was taking off again, but I couldn't really tell for sure. But that, in that classic Pacific Northwest cloudy sky, I recognize that even in black and white. It's just, there's no mistaking it. You, just, you, know, you know you're at home right there. So one more flyover. There's our friend the hangar down there in the little tower. And there goes Lindy. Now, um, when he left Seattle, he flew down and buzzed the state capitol. Then he flew out to Aberdeen and Hoquiam and flew around there and then landed in Portland. Um, yeah, look at the tour that he went on. Look at the crazy tour. <laughs> So, yeah. so maybe if maybe his expression makes sense then, <laughs> like kind of that sort of that that dazed look on his face. All right, um, there are other visitors. Okay, aviation became a way to spread messages of peace and economic development and all sorts of ways for countries to connect. Um, and depending on your perspective, a flight could be called a goodwill mission or it might be called a propaganda flight. And that's what they called the visit of the ANT four in October of 1929. This is a Soviet plane. Um, it's designed by um, Andrei Nikolaev Tupolev. That's the ANT part. You know, there's, there's two big names in Russian or Soviet aviation. There's Tupolev and Antonov. And it's very confusing that Tupolev calls his planes ANTs because it sounds like you're looking at an Antonov, but it's actually Andrei Nikolaevich Tupolev. Um, the ANT-4 visited Sandpoint um, very briefly in October of 1929. It came the opposite direction of the around the world flight. It came from the Soviet Union, crossed over to the Aleutian Islands, flew through Alaska, then came down the coast. And I've never been able to find any footage of it here in Seattle. There's, there's some still photos, including a few that were just discovered a few days ago that I have in the presentation we'll see in a moment ago. But I found this clip from the University of Alaska. This is the ANT-4 taking off from Seward. Um, Alaska and headed for, this is probably f about a week before it's supposed to be in Seattle. But the uh, ANT-4 is, it's based on a German design. It's corrugated aluminum. It's one of the earliest, if not the earliest, all-metal airplane. Like the, the, the plane we looked at that flipped over at Sandpoint, that's fabric, right? It's, you can see where it's all torn. It's been treated with a thing called dope to give it some you know, strength and, and waterproof ability. But this is one of the first metal planes. So watch this little clip here. And what I like most about this clip is, you know, we had those, those uh, floats that Pocock designed for the Around the World flight, and they looked very, uh, not aerodynamic, they just looked very smooth. They glided through the water, and they got a minimal amount of, of uh, friction, right, to allow the plane to take off. Same, with, same thing that allowed the boys in the boat to win the gold medal. I don't think Pocock designed the, uh, the um, pontoons on the ANT-4, but just watch, watch as it, it doesn't actually take off, but we see it come pretty close to taking off here. And it says, Strana Sovietov, Land of the Soviets is the name of it. My brother said it's, thought it said, thanks Obama, but I said, that's not what it said. That's, that's, that's my brother's twisted sense of humor. But look at the open cockpit on top, and just the shape of that. Even without that Cyrillic writing, you'd look at that, without any foreknowledge, you think, that's a Russian plane. It's just, it doesn't look American. You know what I mean? Is that, am I crazy when I say that? It looks very Soviet to me. It looks very five-year plan kind of thing. Very heavy. Only two engines, though. But watch, just look at the amount of water these pontoons kick up, up and under, like hitting up under the underside of the fuselage. Look at that. It's either a testament to bad design of the uh, pontoons or incredible power of the engines that it can actually take off. So it took off from Seward, it went to Sitka, and then it, around October 4th, it was supposed to leave Sitka and then arrive in Seattle the next day. So. Um, Everyone gathers, thousands of people, a lot of the big Russian community. And in 1929, we, the Russians, Soviets weren't our enemy yet, the way they would become after the Cold War. I mean, we still even had that period in World War II. I still remember as a little kid during the Cold War, thinking the Soviets were our enemy, to look at stuff from 1943, and it's like, our great Soviet allies. And I was so confused by that. So in 1929, this, it's, it's about 12 years after the revolution. The Soviets are definitely, it's definitely a communist, socialist country. 
But there isn't the, uh, it's, there's no Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union at this point, although this has been described as a propaganda flight. So it takes off. Uh, the big Russian community is waiting out at Sand Point. This plane's supposed to be there about 3 in the afternoon. It's, it's October, right? Like it's uh, mid-October, early October. Gets dark by about 5 o'clock. 4 o'clock comes, five, no sign of the plane, no sound of the engine, nothing. Uh, people go home after dark. They figure something's gone dreadfully wrong with the airplane. And in fact, something did go dreadfully long. After it took off from Sitka, it ran into trouble around a place called Doll Island um, and a place called Waterfall, Alaska. It had some engine trouble, and they had to land. They had pontoons, so they landed safely. But it took them about 10 days to get a replacement engine. And so by about October 17th, the, the ANT-4 does arrive in Seattle. And it's almost like the opposite of what they did with the world flight. Instead of coming here on wheels and leaving on pontoons, it came on pontoons and left here on wheels. Um, these are some pictures that uh, I just discovered a couple days ago that a, a local woman, her great uncle was an aviator at Sand Point from 1929 to sometime in the early 30s. He died in a crash in 1934. These are just personal photos from a scrapbook of when the Soviet, the land of Soviets plane was visiting. Now, they stored it in that army hangar, right? That big army hangar that we talked about. Um, and it's almost an urban legend or a myth or something, but supposedly there were Boeing engineers or some people kind of reverse engineered or spent a lot of time investigating this all metal airplane, right? We hadn't, the US hadn't necessarily built something similar to this yet. Not with that weird Soviet kind of nose that this thing has, but a um, corrugated metal, uh, corrugated aluminum frame or uh, skin. So the rumor is that, they, the, that Boeing sort of stole a bunch of Soviet design information from this plane. And then when Boeing came out with their model 247 a couple of years later, this plane supposedly has DNA from the ANT-4 in it. I don't know, do you see any, I don't see a resemblance, but it's, you know, it's two engines. Anyway, that, that's sort of the, the dark and dirty secret that might be no proof for any of that. It's all just speculation. Um, but the, uh, rather than spending two weeks here, the Soviet um, flyers were here for about four days. The, they stayed at the Olympic Hotel. Um, they, didn't, they didn't have any regular clothes to go out about the city in, so people chipped in and bought them, had them tailored suits made for them. They were entertained, big dinners and everything. They were sort of the toast of the town for three or four days before getting in the plane and flying on their tour around the country. They met with Henry Ford. They wanted to meet with Henry Ford. They were able to. And they wanted to fly to New York and meet with President Hoover, who they eventually met with President Hoover as well. So again, some people call it a propaganda flight. Other people just call it a, you know, because there was talk of Soviet um, cooperation and great economic development in the Pacific Northwest and new markets for Northwest products in the, in the Soviet Union. Same stuff you hear now whenever there's anything like this nowadays, though it's relatively free, infrequent. Um, all right, let's see here. Okay, so Sandpoint, it kind of matures and evolves in the 1930s. Actually, by the late 1920s is when they're starting to um, build one of the, the first really big hangars, like we see in the photo over on the right-hand side. Um, and they put actual drainage in the field, so it's not that just a, like a muddy, uh, rutted field, and begin laying the ground for actually eventually, but not quite yet, paving those runways, and really ramping up the amount of activity they're doing there, because um, you know World War II isn't on the horizon yet by the early 30s. But there's definitely a sense that there will be another war at some point, and that a, a, a mechanized Navy, a mechanized Air Force, all these things will be critical to American defense. And uh, it's frankly seen as economic development. I mean, the real estate people, the city leaders, the Chamber of Commerce, having a Navy base is like an economic engine. Because I think the greatest number of people employed at Sand Point was during World War II. Something like 8,000 people were working there. The idea of, I've been there on a busy day when there's lots of soccer games and stuff going on, but the idea of 8,000 people in that spot is pretty amazing to think about. But before we get to World War II, we have the Boeing Clipper is um, tested out at Matthews Beach. Now, Matthews Beach has been a city park since the 1950s. In the 1930s, it was just a private beach club. Boeing rented the space. They built a guard shack and built a dock. And in, from about June of 1938 for about the next year, they tested the Boeing Clipper, the 314, one of their biggest passenger planes they'd built to date at that point. Kind of like a, uh, kind of like perfecting a buggy whip, right? This, the, the era of the giant float plane Clipper is only, is only a couple years, really. It, does, it didn't really pencil out. It's a, it's a very, um, very expensive craft to operate, and it's huge and very heavy. So I love this picture of it taking off. You can see the, uh, I'm guessing that's the north, the west side of the lake, and uh, visible in that photo. This is the dock that they built. 
I love this diagram that shows the interior. It's almost like a flying, flying ocean liner. I mean, it really, I don't know if you've traveled by air lately. I don't, I don't think there's a dining lounge on anything I've flown on in the last uh, 30 years. Um, I like the staircase up in the nose of the plane too. That's pretty cool. Or the uh, engineer's compartment up in the up in the engine there on the wing. And the interior photo, you know, where it's actually high ceilings and uh, china and silverware. But if you've been to Matthews Beach, which is actually, that's the same spot where they took that really famous photograph of the kids who can't swim because the lake is polluted with sewer, where it says no swimming. That, it was, that photo was taken at Matthews Beach as well. Um, but it was this glamorous era of airline travel that was you know, curtailed by World War II, but also just curtailed by the economics of, of the, the expense of, uh, of and inefficiency of a plane that's this big, trying to make airline travel something for the masses. This, this, this didn't compute for that kind of uh, equation. But I, I love these aerial photographs. It's such a beautiful airplane, and it's um, what Boeing did so well, you know, the first half of the 20th century, flying boats, anything that took off on the water, whether it was their original mail planes or a plane like this, they look graceful when they're in the water, and they look graceful in the air, and that's not true of all float planes. They, they, they managed to kind of hit the best of both worlds with that, I think, personally. Oh, yeah, question. Is that the same area as the Spruce Goose? That that's after World War II, yeah, that, and that's, you know, that met its own, <laughs> it flew once, right? <laughs> Clipper flew more than once. Um, and this, this, these, these planes are aluminum. Um, let's see, here's the, uh, this is a piece of footage, it's from Baltimore. It's not actually Sandpoint, but it's a water takeoff of a Clipper with a really nice uh, kind of over-the-top narration by a narrator, newsreel narrator. <laughs> Just like, I mean, the cockpit looks like an office. There's like all oh, these extra room. You could have an extra desk up in the cockpit if you wanted to. It's pretty amazing. Um, again, very short-lived era there at, Mattis, at Matthews Beach, just about a year. There was some kind of regular service there between uh, Seattle and Alaska, but it wasn't like there was an actual formal airport there. It's sort of, it's sort of kind of a, its own category there. It wasn't like you could go and buy a ticket and fly from Matthews Beach, but they did do some regular air service there. It's a little murky as far as I understand. All right, that gets us to World War II. Um, this is a great map of the airfield um, from, seen from overhead. Huge, huge advance compared to that little grassy field that we saw from the 1920s where the, you know, the plane is bouncing down the runway and flipping over onto its back. This is, they've leveled things, they've poured concrete, it's got drainage, it's, it's all completely modernized. And on the left-hand side, um, that's kind of the bread and butter of Sandpoint during World War II are PBYs, these are patrol boats who used to fly out and look for submarines and look for other uh, enemy naval stuff out um, beyond on the Pacific Coast coast, and they're on the seaplane ramp, um, and this is still there at the north edge of uh, the parking lot there at Sandpoint by one of those big hangars where they have the indoor soccer course now, um, and it's, there's concrete, but there's also these really cool granite blocks, they're like maybe four inch square Durex granite blocks that were cut and laid by you know, stone cutters. I don't think there's, there, there's, no, um, there's no grout, there's nothing really, there might be some, something anchoring them on either side, but it goes out for several feet out into the water to allow a float plane to come up and then be pulled up onto the, onto the dry land. And it's still there and it looks like it hasn't budged an inch in uh, more than 80, 85, almost 90 years at this point. Um, but yeah, I mentioned there's 8,000 people working there at, at its peak in World War II and that's, that's because the, the PBY overhaul and repair, the o, o and, o and R, O and I, overhaul and repair, that doesn't, O and I doesn't match to overhaul and repair. I apologize. Um, the, uh, they would re restore planes that were damaged. They would um, outfit new aircraft carriers. Where they, you know, they fly in the planes that are going to be assigned to an aircraft carrier and assemble those um, squadrons at Sandpoint and then transfer them to the aircraft carriers. It was really key to the whole 13th district um, of the Pacific and the, the naval district during World War II. A lot of people coming and going. You know, all of Seattle during World War II 
the housing was in short supply. It was a 24-hour city for the first time really ever in terms of restaurants and all sorts of other uh, attractions for uh, service people spending their time um, in their off hours. Even the, uh, the, the Midway drive-in down that was a swap meet for a while, now it's long gone down there on the Pacific Highway. That used to, they used to have showings all night. There'd be a 2 o'clock showing of the movie or a 3 o'clock showing of the movie just because there was so much demand and everyone, you know, there were people were working all shifts at the um, defense plants. So for the first time really ever, we become this 24-hour city. And I think that went away pretty quick after World War II ended, but at least for, for about five or six years there, it's a rate, a rate of growth and people moving here and stuff just happening faster than it's ever happened before. And so much of it obviously is driven by the war effort. And for Sandpoint, that was all this, this work on all these uh, PBYs. Um, so when the war ends, I love this shot. This is from the Seattle Post-Intelligencer from October of 1945. It says, now it can be shown. Basically, you know, it was a secret what was really going on at Sandpoint. And though you could see it from the water, you could see it from the hill, you couldn't publish an aerial photograph of a Navy base during World War II. And so this is about, what, two months after VJ Day? Yeah, almost exactly two months after VJ Day. The Seattle PI publishes this aerial photo showing all the hangars that have been built starting in 1929 down on the lower left-hand side, all the paved runways that have been built since the mid-30s up in the upper part there, and then all the support buildings and uh, housing for officers and housing along the uh, what's now Sandpoint Way and the gatehouse and everything there. It's just a really, it's a great shot. And I love this notion of like the war is over, we can finally show the picture. And uh, like most military bases after World War II, um, you know, things changed rapidly, right? There's massive, um, massive amount of people leaving the service, right? We're not, we're not fighting an active war anymore, but we are fighting the Cold War. We are thinking about the future, trying being, uh, being prepared for whatever conflict comes next. Um, so Sandpoint begins a transition to be, being more of a naval reserve base, something where, you know, because it's got such a great location, because it's close to Seattle, has all this uh, infrastructure that's been built, there's no sense in just shutting it down. Other bases started to shut down, other, you know, stuff that's sprung up as just training bases during World War II. A lot of those, a lot of those were shut down, not Sandpoint. It just sort of morphed. And one of the ways it morphed was in having a place where aviators, young aviators, could, could take out planes on, on uh, practice flights to, you know, gain more hours and get more experience. And there's a couple of famous, now famous for being missing, a couple of missing aviators who, there's two gentlemen in the audience today, Sean Murphy and Lee Corbin, who are old friends of mine. They did the research on these missing aviators um, and uh, we'll go through what happened with this pretty incredible story. Um, back in March of 1949, Gaston Mays on the left and Ben Vreeland on the right, they took off on their SNJ Texan trainer. It's a two-person, you know, a naval training plane. They left Sandpoint and headed, uh, headed to the east uh, for probably a couple hour flight, just flying around, getting some hours, practicing some you know, different, different uh, moves in the air that you do when you're a young naval aviator and you're just trying to get more hours and uh, look for promotions and figure out what you want to do next. So um, they never came back, uh, sadly. And uh, ultimately, Black Lake is where they thought these guys might have crashed. And Black Lake on this map, um, if, if you look in the, in the lower left-hand side of the map is Fall City. So Black Lake is in that ellipse there in the upper right. It's up in the Cascade foothills. It's all private timberland now. You can't get there. It's all, you know, there's big fences. It's all fenced off. Um, Warehouse and other timber companies own that land. And it was, it was a place that was being logged back in those days. So the incredible part of the story, there's, well, there's a couple incredible parts of the story. Um, the mother of Gaston Mays came back. The family came out from Tennessee and helped search for him that summer. And Mrs. Mays came back every year for 20 years. Um, different loggers had thought they'd heard the sound of a plane near Black Lake. They found some evidence floating in the lake that might have been like a, uh, one of those dye capsules they used to mark, you know, a, a, I found a floating, a, a life vest. All these different clues pointed to Black Lake being the ultimate resting place for the plane. They did really early underwater searches using metal detectors made by White, uh, that company in Oregon that made a lot of metal detectors up into the, and they, I don't know if they're still in business. 
they had a frog team of divers from the local police departments and stuff diving in the lake back in 1960. Uh, Mrs. Mays passed away back in the 70s, and her family had pretty much given up on ever finding or ever getting any resolution about this uh, this missing plane, these two missing aviators. But Lee and Sean, they didn't give up. Um, they, I can't remember how Lee, how did you stumble across the story, Lee? Do you recall how you first found the story? Uh, I just, as usual, I was looking for something else. <laughs> came across a blog from a guy um, who was the nephew of Ben Rio, uh, a photographer down in Albuquerque, and he had just mentioned something about his uncle having disappeared on a flight from Sam Point. And so I just started dating him. That's how I came across the story about more of yeah. And Sean had done something similar. And Sean and Lee didn't know each other, but I knew each of them. And I, was, I did a story about this for the radio station maybe five or six years ago. And I introduced Sean and Lee, and they worked together on launching another search of Black Lake. Inconclusive search because there's just mud on the bottom, very thick mud. Um, anything that, that crashed into Black Lake is just almost impossible to find. But to their credit, they got the naval, uh, the U.S. Navy to finally agree that officially the resting place of that plane is Black Lake. And so back in 2021, they dedicated a monument. That's, um, that's one of the nephews of the flyers there um, in that picture by the stone monument there at Black Lake. And then later that autumn, uh, they came back and we did a, a flyover from these, uh, an SNJ flyover, which was really, this is uh, the niece and nephew of the, of one of the fly, the Vreeland, of Ben Vreeland in the foreground there, and that's Sean there on the right-hand side, and here's the, the flyover of the SNJ trainer over Black Lake. Pretty cool to be there that day. That was pretty amazing. It was pretty cool to see that monument dedicated, to see those family members there having some closure for their lost family member from you know, almost, what, almost 75 years ago. There, the monument at Black Lake you can't really get to. It's not very publicly accessible, but there's a smaller version of it at the VFW in Snoqualmie. It's VFW, right? No. Uh, American Legion in Snoqualmie. Um, and uh, that whole notion of, I mean, there's so many airplanes that took off from Sandpoint and disappeared. That was one of the most famous ones because the mom came back every year for 20 years, never gave up on the search. A pretty amazing story, what she did. Um, and, you know, Sam, this is a picture of Sam Point from 1957. Yeah, it still looks the same as it did pretty much at the end of World War II. You know, all the runways are there, all the hangars are there. They didn't make any major changes to it at that point. But the activity had really curtailed. It was becoming more of a supply base. It was, it was you know, weekend warriors like we saw in that opening film were coming in there to do their training on the weekends and not much else was going on. And by the time you get to 1970, that's June 30th, all the airplane stuff was curtailed completely. The Navy began slowly you know, backing out of the property. Um, that's when the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expressed an interest in mooring all their ships there. That didn't happen. There was a lot of community um, pushback on that. A lot of people wanted to keep it as a private, uh, private airport, and there was a lot of pushback on that from people living in View Ridge, didn't want you know, Cessnas taken off at all hours. Um, so there was a lot of this typical Seattle process about what the future of the, of the site would be. Um, it's kind of sad there's not an air, uh, airstrip there anymore. That's kind of a... It could be this incredible historic, you know, airstrip with almost a, with more than a century of history if they had maintained some kind of aerial component there. But the park was dedicated back in 1977. I think the Navy finally pulled out its last operation in 1995. They shut down their supply bureau there. But if you drive around Sandpoint now, you can see these these little bits of evidence, like that that seaplane ramp there at the north end, um, bits of the old runway that they that they sort of cut into parking lots in the west part of the park. Uh, or east part of the park, and some of the uh, ammunition bunkers that were alongside the old old runways there. My hope is that the friends of Magnuson Park will devote a lot of resources to interpretation. And whether it, if it never becomes a national park or a national historic monument, it, there's at least some way for 
someone who just shows up there to learn about the aviation history or for someone who really loves aviation history to have a destination because I think the pieces are all there if the story is told correctly to really to really show how this really was the cradle of aviation in the Pacific Northwest. Um, if you do your own field research, start right there at the entrance where that monument is. That's the uh, Alonzo, uh, Victor Alonzo um, monument there with the bronze wings and the uh, spire there with a the plaque about the flyers. You can see that you have to sort of perch there. I think that that's, that's Lee is there on the left-hand side, but there's no room for pedestrians to stand there. And there is some talk of trying to move this monument to a place that's a little more amenable to being appreciated rather than just alongside the Sandpoint Way like that. So, um, 